Morning Table family. Uh, Easter is four weeks away, and I don't know about you, but yesterday was kind of one of those unexpected days where I walked out of the house needing sunglasses, and then I needed my umbrella, and then there was a full-on blizzard where I needed my gloves and my scarf. Uh, you never know what to expect in the month of March, right? Uh, I was just a little girl when the wedding of Princess Diana and Prince Charles aired on television. For some of you, this was before you were alive. For others of you, you might remember that wedding. We, the world was fascinated by this fairy tale wedding. Uh, every grocery store you went to, it was on the front page of the magazines uh, and, the, and the newspapers. The royal wedding was watched by 750 million people. And keep in mind, this was before social media when you actually had to go find a box called a television to watch anything. Uh, it was an amazing, beautiful wedding, and the world was captivated. But like so many stories, that love story did not turn out like anyone expected it to. In fact, sadly, uh, the couple divorced in 1996, and tragically, in 1997, uh, princess Diana, the beloved princess, was killed in a tragic car accident, and two billion people watched her funeral on television all around the world. My little girl self could have never imagined a story that started so beautiful, right, with such beauty, could end with such tragedy. It's been said that life happens when we make other plans. Anybody ever feel like that? You make plans and then life happens and it's not anything like we expected. Life unfolds in unexpected ways, in unexpected times, in unexpected places. And can I tell you the story of Easter is the one of the most unexpected stories in history with some plot twists that nobody could see coming. Now, if you were raised in church and know the story of Easter, we can fall into this trap of familiarity, right? Sometimes when we're uh, all too familiar with a story, it kind of loses its punch and its power. Kind of like when my husband uh, would tell my kids, hey, remember the time that I met Michael Jordan? And all of us would roll our eyes and say, you've told us that story a thousand times, right? It was the English author who lived in the 1300s that said, familiarity can breed contempt. Sometimes we hear things so many times, it's just like background noise and it doesn't have any meaning. I remember when we first moved to the neighborhood where we're at, there's a a train track about a mile away. And when we first moved, we heard the trains all the time. But now I never hear them. They're still there, but I just drown them out. They just, I don't even notice it anymore. Most of us can tell the facts of what happened on certain days. I can tell you the facts of what happened at Princess Di's wedding. I can tell you the details of her dress. But guess what? I didn't personally experience it. I wasn't there. I can't tell you what the temperature was that day. I can't tell you what the flowers smelled like. I can't tell you how many people were in the crowd because I was not there. You know, I, I believe that many of us were kind of familiar with the appearance of Easter. Now, if you were raised in the church, maybe, you know, you're familiar with the cross and the empty tomb and flowers and the meaning of of Easter. Some of you for Easter, it was just Easter bunnies and Easter baskets and a reason to eat some good candy, right? We know the appearance of Easter, but sometimes we don't have the experience of Easter. And my prayer is that during the next few weeks as we head into this Easter experience, that we will experience what God's true meaning is for Easter for us in ways that maybe we never have before. No matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, uh, no matter what your experience has been with Easter to the present, I believe that God wants to, us to experience the true power and meaning of Easter like never before. 
we're going to walk through what we call the Holy Week. Some people call it the Passion Week. It's the week that leads up to the crucifixion. And we're going to unpack some things that happen so that we can kind of immerse ourselves and get a better understanding of what is so unique and what is so powerful about this story. Now, to understand the story of Easter, you kind of have to understand the context of what was happening in the world back in the day. So can you just take like three minutes and can I take you to school for just a minute, okay? Uh, the Roman Empire was dominating at the time where Jesus showed up on the scene. Uh, and the ancient Roman civilization started 8th century BC, and it was actually founded by uh, King Romulus, because he named it after himself, Rome, Romulus, right? Uh, and it grew uh, to be very rich and powerful over the next few hundred years. Uh, and by AD 117, the whole of Italy, I want you to check out this map. Italy, the lands around the Mediterranean, much of Europe, all the parts you see in red, including England, Wales, parts of Scotland, were all dominated by the Roman Empire. That's a lot of space, right? That's a lot of influence. Uh, here's a fun fact. Did you know that Rome was seven times more populated than our current day New York City? Now, I've lived in New York City there's a lot of people in New York City. I cannot imagine seven times more people living in New York City. It's crazy. And I think it's interesting that the Romans actually called Christians atheists because they didn't believe in their gods. Kind of a twist. Rome was built on a culture, as many have heard, of violence and brutality uh, when Rome conquered a city, they killed everyone, women, children, young, old, babies. Uh, the Roman army was one of the most successful and savage armies the world had ever seen to that point. They would practice the cruelty of conviction to kill not just Christians, but slaves. They would kill um, foreigners that broke the law uh, in, in terrible ways. And the Romans would actually use people as human candles at parties, if you can even imagine. Uh, and for entertainment, for fun during lunchtime and birthday parties, they would actually have people put into an arena and let loose wild animals to tear them apart. This was the Roman Empire. Somebody say, oh no. <laughs> I don't think so. But this was the cultural realities when Jesus showed up on the scene. So you can understand Jesus and the disciples and those around him had certain expectations of where they needed help. Because usually we want God to meet us at our pain point. And Rome was dominating and it was ugly. I think it's interesting that the followers of Jesus had hoped he would actually come and take power. And that he would take the Romans out of power. And he would have a dominant militant approach, but many of us know that that didn't happen. In fact, after Jesus died, listen to what the disciples actually had to say to Jesus. They said, we had hoped that he was the Messiah who would come to rescue Israel. They were disappointed. They had different expectations of who they thought Jesus was going to be. They wanted a new ruler who would come and overthrow these evil Roman leaders. And they had put their hope in Jesus, but he didn't do exactly what he ex they expected him to do. And there was a plot twist that happened that they never saw coming. They would discover that hope lives in unexpected places. And during that week before Easter, Jesus gathers all of the disciples and they have what we call now the last supper. It's the last time Jesus is going to gather and have time with his followers before the crucifixion. And this is where we start out. We're going to look at some different parts of what Jesus says, uh, significant things he says during this last supper time together. It starts out in Luke 22. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal 
again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus starts off this last dinner by talking about a kingdom, but not the kingdom that they were thinking about. They said, oh, we, we thought you were going to talk to us about some secret strategy, how we could uh, overcome and get rid of these evil rulers. But no, Jesus starts talking about God's kingdom. This was an unexpected twist. In fact, uh, later Jesus talks, and we're going to have communion today, but they we're talking uh, and listening to Jesus because some things that he were saying he was saying was clashing with what he expected them to do. In Luke 22, it says he sat around and he took some bread, he gave thanks for it, broke it into pieces, and he starts telling them, "This is my body." He's telling them what's about to happen. My body is about to be broken for you. And he breaks up the bread and he passes it around. And then after supper, he takes the cup and he says, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people. It's an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The key word here is covenant. We all understand covenants and agreements, right? Uh, how many have ever signed a lease or mortgage payment? Kind of painful, right? When you're signing away, it feels like you're signing away your life. Uh, if you've ever signed a marriage license, I remember the day that Greg and I signed our marriage license. That was a more happy day. <laughs> I like those kinds of agreements. If you've ever had an appointment agreement or signed any type of lease, those are relational connections, covenants. And Jesus reveals here the first secret of how hope lives in unexpected places. See, they wanted a ruler, but Jesus showed up and said, no, I want relationship. I want restored relationship. I'm not here for any political party. I'm not here to make it happen for you in any other way, but I am here for a real life relationship. They expected him to rise up as a political leader and change society, but Jesus says, no, I care more about you personally. What are you expecting from Jesus these days? I'm the first to admit I often have unrealistic expectations from God. Uh, sometimes I treat him more like a genie in a bottle. God, will you just give me what I want? And if we're not careful, we can turn our relationship with God into this transactional situation. God, if I do this, you give me that, right? This transaction that happens. And Jesus made it very clear. I'm not here for a transactional relationship. I'm here for relationship. The disciples had to adjust their expectations. And so do we. Jesus was not here to lead some military campaign as many expected him to do. He wanted to make close and personal contact with the people that he came to serve. Jesus reveals another expectation as we continue to read on. I love this. He says, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, and yet they're called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Say, it will be different. Jesus is saying, things around here are going to be different than what you expected them to be. I love this. He says, those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like the servant. That's a plot twist. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The ones who sit at the table, of course, but not here, Jesus says. He corrects them. He says, not here. Things are going to be different here. For I am among you as one who serves. Jesus breaks down the motivation of why he came. See, they wanted a warrior, but he came as a servant. This is most definitely not what they wanted from Jesus in that moment. They had this picture of this bloody Braveheart scene of a leader going out and taking a sword and tearing out all of the Romans. But Jesus came more like Mr. Rogers and saying, won't you be my neighbor? Let me show you a different way to love. I remember when my kids were little. Any good parent knows we don't always give our kids what they want. Right, Vicki? Got a mom over here of seven kids. She's like, I know what you're talking about. We give our kids what they need, not always what they want. 
Because sometimes they don't know the difference. And sometimes we don't know the difference between what we truly want and what we truly need. God doesn't want to give us what we always want. But he will give us what we need. Amen? Maybe we should stop demanding what we want from God and saying, God, would you just give me what I need? I don't even know what that is sometimes. But God, would you give me what I need? Never forget when Jesus taught the disciples to pray. He said, give us today our daily bread. I will take a God who came to serve (laughs) over a God who came to fight a political battle any day. At the end of the day, that's the God who I want to serve. As they wrap up the last supper, Jesus closes with this really intimate and close conversation with Peter. Remember Peter? The guy's always sticking his foot in his mouth, right? Jumping out of boats, doing crazy things. Uh, But he was the one that Jesus chose to build the church. And he breaks down one more expectation that we have. Jesus reveals that hard days are ahead for Peter. He knows that there's hard days coming. Uh, He's going to deny Jesus, but Jesus assures, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to strengthen you. And, And when Jesus is breaking down what's about to happen, Peter is the first to deny He's the first to say, uh, no, I don't really like this plan. This doesn't sound good. In fact, in Luke twenty two thirty three, 33, Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you. I am even willing to die for you, he says. And then Jesus gives him a little reality check, right? He says, oh, Peter, actually, you're not going to deny me once or twice. You're going to deny me three times in the next 24 hours. A prophecy, by the way, that would unfold exactly how Jesus described it. But then Jesus changes the subject. And he starts talking with them about preaching and saying, hey, when I'm gone, you're going to carry on this good work. It's going to live far beyond me. I'm going to go back to the Father in heaven. And you're going to take everything I've taught you in the last three years. And you are going to spread it throughout the world. And you no longer need me. And they are sitting there thinking, you can't leave us yet. It's only been 36 months. Are you kidding me? I'm not ready yet. Right? And he reveals this thing, that they wanted perfect plans but he wanted an eternal purpose. How many just wish things would go as you plan more often in life? Sometimes I just wish, could things just go a little bit? I just, I relate with Peter. Uh, If Jesus would have told me, hey, bumpy times are ahead. You're going to deny me. Things are going to get ugly. Things are going to get worse before they get better. I might have said, oh, Jesus, could we change that plan? Could we just tweak that just a little bit? I prefer to have it go a little bit smoother. Uh, I don't want there to be these problems. I don't want to make mistakes. I don't want to mess up. But Jesus says, no, it's, it's okay. And he assures Peter, I love the words of Jesus, Luke 22, 32. He says, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, so that your faith should not fail. I love that. So that when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Notice Jesus doesn't doesn't say if. He says when. He doesn't say, hey, if you make it, If you turn and make things right, he says, no, when you come back, it's going to be okay, Peter. You're going to make some mistakes. But when you come back to me, strengthen your brothers. He was saying, hey, you can't mess up my plans, right? You might might mess up some things, but you can't mess up my purposes. You can mess up some plans, but you can't mess up God's purposes. How many are grateful today that we can stand here and say, yeah, I might have messed up some plans, but God's purposes are eternal and they still remain. I don't know about you, but I need a God whose purposes I can depend on. Because sometimes I mess up. Sometimes it doesn't go according to my plan. We're going to make mistakes. But Jesus wants us to stay focused on his purpose. Not many of us can say that our lives have turned out exactly as we planned, right? Uh, Our plans change Uh, When I was in college, I changed my major three times. 
I think the average is five or something like that. Uh, but I changed my major three th times. I just couldn't figure it out. I, I signed up for um, elementary education. I thought I would be a school teacher. And then they put me in the schools for a few weeks. And I said, no, thank you. Uh, Nix that. Uh, then I decided I'm going to be a journalism major, right? And then that just, it got, it was boring. Can I just say I was bored? And then I was already involved in my church, and one day I remember God saying, no, I've got something else. That wasn't being in ministry, planting churches from coast to coast. It wasn't even on my radar. I had a career planned. I thought I, had, I was going to do some other things. And God said, will you follow me into the ministry? And I said, yes. And let me tell you, when you say yes to Jesus, buckle your seatbelts, because what happened the last 27 years is we ended up planting churches in Minneapolis, a little bit in Chicago, Harlem, New York, Seattle, now Federal Way. You never know what Jesus is going to do when we simply say yes to him. Our change, our plans change, but God's purposes never change. As we step into this Easter season, God wants us to remind us that hope often lives in unexpected places. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think I, I would feel better if my retirement account was just a little bit, you know, better and where it's supposed to be. I, I would feel just a little bit better if, you know, a few people in my life would kind of change some attitudes and get on board with what we're doing. I would feel a little bit better if... And God is saying, no, don't put your hope in things out there changing. Look up and put your hope in me because I never change. God is the same yesterday, today, and all eternity. Our hope in him is the only hope that will be secure. Everything around us is going to fail and fall apart. And the disciples realized that, that when the world fell apart around them, that Jesus, his words rang true. That exactly what he said, hey, keep your eyes on my kingdom. Don't look at the kingdom around. Don't look at the culture. Don't, don't worry about the election coming up this fall, right? If Jesus was here today, I think he'd be saying, hey, look at my kingdom. My kingdom is secure. It's eternal. It doesn't change. But everything around us is going to change. And we come to God with these expectations. They wanted a ruler. But he said, no, I have something better for you. I came to give you real life relationship. I came to bridge the gap between you and God. Many of us feel distant from God and Jesus is saying, hey, I'm the bridge. I'm the bridge. If you come to me, I will make that connection with God to you. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus showed us the very heart of God. Anybody remember that song years ago, What If God Was One of Us? <laughs> Just a slob like one of us. <laughs> I don't think Jesus was a slob. But I think God knew that we needed to know that there was a God who came and walked in our shoes. But he did it in such an unexpected way that the disciples almost missed it. They almost missed it because they wanted something different. Can I tell you, don't miss what God wants to do in this season of your life. Sometimes we can go through the motions and have different expectations, but God is saying, listen, if you come a little bit closer, if you listen to me, I have something even better for you. Don't miss it. They wanted a ruler. He wanted restored relationship. They wanted a warrior. But he came as a servant. Aren't you glad that we have a God that came to serve us? You know, most world religions, we try to appease a God, right? You try to do enough, pray hard enough, do more good works than bad things, the whole karma situation. And God is saying, no, actually, I'm the God who came to serve you. He flipped the script. And they wanted perfect plans. Peter wanted some perfect plans. He didn't want to mess up. He didn't want to make mistakes. But Jesus said, no, I'm focused on eternal purpose. We're going to take communion today together. If my ushers can come and start passing out the elements and if the worship team could come. Just believe that today 
God wants to bring home to us the reality of what communion means. Now, many of us are used to celebrations, right? Our lives kind of revolve around celebrations, anniversaries, birthdays, right? My grandma just had her big 100th birthday party. There were 70 people there. It's a big celebration. We like to celebrate things. Why do we celebrate? Because celebrations help us remember what is most important. And at the Last Supper, I love it that Jesus said, hey, these people are going to need to remember what I did on the cross. So when they took communion together, he says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. I don't want you to forget this sacrifice I made. I don't want you to forget. I know life gets crazy and Jesus being all-knowing would know that through the ages and over the centuries that life would change and yet one thing never changes our need for a savior doesn't matter what culture you were raised in it doesn't matter what part of the world you're from our need for a savior never changes and Jesus says I want you to do this so for the last 2,000 years Christians from all over the world, from all different walks of life, all different tribes and tongues and languages have been practicing what we are going to do. And I love to look at communion as we're sitting at this long table that goes back 2,000 years. And there's people from all over the world that are taking communion together, remembering what Jesus did. Somebody say, remember. I want to remember. I never want to forget the God who loved me so much he would be willing to suffer and die for me.